that I'd like to introduce our first speaker uh, today, um, who is a Stanford alum, Akshay uh, Baskaran. I actually met him about 10, 12 years ago when he took my sophomore seminar, which in which he was an ACE student. He subsequently here, even before he left, did a dynamite um, honors thesis at the Center for International Security and Arms Control, which is a big um, departure from chemical engineering, which is his major at that point, and did uh, look it up, a dynamite uh, thesis on this little um, uh, province, it's actually a big province, a low-income, uh, drought-prone, uh, agronomic uh, corner of China up in the upper uh, left-hand uh, part of China, uh, which also happened to have a very good uh, uh, geology for shale gas. So you might imagine some merging of technical issues with uh, uh, international relation type issues for those of you on the IR side of the, the house here. So since then, uh, Akshay's become I guess a serial entrepreneur, but a very thoughtful one, and done start, uh, some consulting at Bain for a while, and then startups in the uh, uh, water sector, even before uh, Impossible food, Foods, the alternative uh, fuel food sector, and the um, uh, alternative cement uh, sectors. I don't want to say anything more about that, because he, he will, and most recently joined a... Um, a uh, company called Gravity, not the uh, John Mayer song, not the uh, song in the uh, movie Frozen, uh, but a company that does uh, uh, consulting uh, about how to do our carbon accounting and how to set up businesses uh, for a lower net zero carbon-ish. So with that said, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Akshay Baskaran to our podium today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you all hear me all right? Good? Good. Yeah. Thank you for coming in person. Uh, I'm probably easier to listen to on 2X, so still appreciate you coming in person and not watching me on the live stream. Um, so, uh, yeah. So my, my goal today is to tell you a little bit about my, about my journey, starting at Stanford here as a chemical engineering student, working with Professor Wyant on my honors thesis, and then talk about how I transitioned to climate tech, working at multiple different startups. And uh, I'll save a lot of time at the end, uh, so you can ask me questions about those experiences directly. But my goal is to share some of the lessons I learned along the way. Uh, I also think it might be interesting to hear my perspective as someone who doesn't believe that climate change is caused by human activity. I'm just kidding. It's April Fool's joke. There's, no, it's, uh, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Obviously, yeah. It would be hard to make a career in climate if you believe that. But uh, yeah, let me jump in and talk first a little bit about my Stanford background and Stanford experience. Uh, so I studied chemical engineering here, as Professor Warren said. Uh, my advisor was uh, Professor Jaramillo, and I worked at SunCat for about three and a half years uh, under Jens Norskoff, uh, Professor Norskoff, uh, in the area of theoretical evaluation of catalysis, um, of, of catalysts. Uh, in addition, so first of all, I think I really value that chemical engineering background, even though I didn't end up practicing as a chemical engineer. When I was at Impossible Foods, I spent time reviewing process flow diagrams, building models to simulate manufacturing plants. And then at Brimstone, the chemical engineering credibility helped me communicate our technology to our investors and to uh, customers at the end of the day. So I'm very grateful for that chemical engineering background, even though I sold my soul and left technology. Uh, I also had a little bit of background in policy, as, as Professor Wine alluded to. I interned at the U.S. Senate for Senator Marine Cantwell over there uh, in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And I also pursued an honors thesis on the energy and water challenges in northwest China, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, in general, I think I'm very grateful for my Stanford experience. I think it provided the right foundation for me to build the rest of my career, and it has laid that groundwork for all the decisions I ended up making on my career journey. So actually, I started my career not in climate, but in management consulting. Um, I worked uh, in San Francisco at a company called Bain & Company, uh, working for utility clients, for private equity clients, for technology and pharmaceutical customers. Uh, that, those experiences were really great in that they built a very strong business foundation for me. Uh, but ultimately, I wasn't working on what I really was passionate about, which was fighting climate change and working on the things that mattered to me. Uh, that said, I made some of the closest friends that I had 
from those experiences at Bain, and I wouldn't have gotten the jobs that I got without that foundation. Um, and so some of you who are Stanford students might be asking yourself, uh, should I go into consulting? Like, I care about energy, I care about climate, is it right for me? And like, that's a very personal decision, but I might lay out the framework for why consulting and why not consulting, because it might be useful to you, and happy to ask, also answer any questions you have about that afterwards. But I think if you really want to build a strong business foundation, and you don't have one coming out of undergraduate, uh, it's a, a great way to do so. And it's, uh, you have a strong brand, brand behind you in one of the major consulting firms, and it could really lay the groundwork for a career in business, if that's something you care about. Uh, there's also great exit opportunities. Uh, these consulting firms have huge networks across a lot of different businesses, and I probably got roles after consulting that I wouldn't have been able to get, even with equal number of years of experiences at startups. And so it is a way to fast track your career. Uh, you also get a broad ex exposure to many different types of business problems, and in many ways it's sort of a paid MBA. Uh, so that, those are all reasons you might want to go into consulting. And the, the other reason why not to do consulting is if you really care about climate and want to dedicate your career to climate, it is unlikely that you'll be able to dedicate yourself to only working on climate projects. And it's really hard work. And if you are motivated by a specific mission, it's hard to like, work on projects related to that mission when you have less control over the projects you work on. So that's some, some little bit about consulting. I thought it might be helpful if anybody was interested in it and considering it. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about uh, why I did consulting. I ended up leaving and going to a company working in strategy called Impossible Foods. Uh, and so some of you may know Impossible. Impossible is a company that makes the Impossible Burger, uh, and it creates plant-based meats in the beef, pork, and chicken sectors. Uh, as you probably know, if you're in this class, you might, you might be aware of this, the animal agricultural industry is incredibly destructive. It contributes an enormous amount of emissions uh, over the, for, the, for the planet. Uh, and I think there's a great graph that I think is worth talking about to talk about the size of the price here, the amount of emissions. And hopefully it's uh, large enough to see this graph on the page. But this is something called a Sankey diagram. Some of you, definitely Professor Wyant, is familiar with it. A Sankey diagram is a diagram that shows how like, the flow of goods, and in this case, the flow of emissions. And in a Sankey diagram here, this is actually a little bit out of date. It's a 2010 Sankey diagram. You see the total emissions in 2010, which adds up to about 50.6 gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions. This diagram breaks it down by the the contribu contributions to those 50 gigatons of emissions by final service, for example, the food sector, the construction sector, the thermal comfort sector, or uh, you can break it down by the individual sector, like meat and dairy, or vegetable foods, or cement, or chemicals. And I really like this graph because it's a really great way to show size of the prize. Like, if you really want to make a huge impact on the climate problem, this is a great starting point to say, hey, if, is what I'm focusing on really going to make a dent in the overall impact on the planet? Um, and as you can see here, if you, you look at the graph, and I'll focus in on it, uh, the meat and dairy sector here, at least in 2010, represented about 5.7 gigatons of CO2. And that's about 11% of global emissions. That's a huge amount of emissions just for a single sector in the food industry. And the reason why is that Animal agriculture requires an enormous amount of land, water, and energy. I think a great way to like, understand why that is is look at the efficiency of the sector. So when you look at uh, th this graph called conversion efficiency, you'll see different parts of the animal agricultural sector. And it shows the conversion of calories in to calories out for human consumption. It also shows the, the protein in versus protein out for human consumption. And on this graph, you can see that for beef, if you put 100 calories in to beef, you only get three calories out for human consumption. And uh, for 100 cal uh, pro grams of protein, you only get three, uh, five grams of protein out. This is a highly inefficient system. And it, it's a great way to represent how we're putting so many resources across land, food, and water, and energy into uh, uh, the, these animal agriculture systems and getting less out for, for human consumption. 
And I think that is a great way to say, like, because these animals are so inefficient, plant-based proteins that can successfully reproduce the taste and texture of animal, animal protein without sacrificing price could have a huge environmental impact. And this is what really motivated me. This is what drew me to the mission at Impossible Foods. So hopefully you can see why I cared about this and why it's a big problem. I also want to talk through some lessons that we learned along the way at Impossible Foods. Specifically, the big challenges coming from a, a small startup when I joined to a much larger company making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and manufacturing hundreds of millions of dollars of product. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the manufacturing scale-up and a very unique, challenges, a unique challenge associated with manufacturing products for consumer goods. So there's something that like my friends and I call the supply and demand pendulum. And when you are rapidly scaling up a manufacturing company, you are constantly going back and forth with this pendulum between being supply constrained and demand constrained. And I think a great way to show this is to start from the early days and talk about what it was like to start to scale up. So in the early days when we launched our product in 2016, we had, at that point in time, just developed a specific ingredient called heme, which is the magic ingredient that made meat taste like meat and it what, what made impossible our products taste more meaty, have that incredible color change, where if you cooked the, the red product, it ended up turning, changing color, just like regular meat did. The way we did that is we had a, a biomanufacturing process that we created in-house, and we had to build some pilot plants, both for the manufacturing of the heme, but also for the manufacturing of our core Impossible Burger product. Pilot plants are small, and so you can only create a small amount of product for sales. And it takes about 18 months, typically, to scale up a pilot plant. So over that time, you only have a small amount of product that you can sell to customers. And so if you're, thinking, if you're us on the business side, what do you do when you have only a small amount of product? You dedicate that product to very high impact, high buzzy like brands. And so we launched with brands like David Chang's Momofuku uh, and uh, Tracy Dujardin Jardinier, a fancy restaurant in San Francisco. And that allowed us to get a lot of chef credibility at that time, where people realized, oh, Impossible Foods, that's the hot new thing. That's really good. Uh, it's because we only had a small amount of product in the first place. We might as well dedicate it to high-end restaurants where we can get the most like, bang for your buck in many ways. Yes, yeah, go on. Was that a partnership that you set up with David Chang, or was that like a... Just he liked it and he used it, or was there? Yeah, it definitely was a partnership. So I think in the early days, we had these co-marketing campaigns uh, where we, we, we definitely sold the product to them, but we both put in money in marketing. Uh, and uh, it was a great opportunity for David Chang. At that time, actually, Momofuku Nishi, he had removed all meat, uh, all plant, uh, vegetarian items from his menu, uh, making it like, because I think he famously said uh, that uh, it's hard to make that good vegetarian food. Uh, and then he brought the Impossible Burger in the menu, and it got a lot of buzz at that time. Uh, so, so this is the type of the strategy that we had at this time, where we were very supply constrained. The limited supply that we had, we had to dedicate to a few customers. Yes. When you were supply constrained, how did you keep track of potential clients as interest in your product grew, so that when you did have supply, that you were able to reach out to them? Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. Uh, you'd get a lot of inbounds. And you try to build a pipeline, but ultimately it's really hard to sign a contract when uh, you have uncertain timelines for a restaurant business. So I think the, one of the unique aspects of a, like a restaurant is that they don't actually update their menu whenever they want. It's not like a digital menu. They have specific times when they can actually change their menu out, especially for these larger chains. So you, you're, the goal is to get the supply at the right time so that you can get on their menu. And so there's a little bit of matchmaking involved. But I think the simple answer to your question is that you can use a Salesforce and other tracking tool, keep tracking leads. Uh, but I think we didn't do as good a job as we could have at tracking all the opportunities here uh, for, for all the sales pipeline. Uh, but because we knew we were supply constrained, of course, after building out the pilot plant, we began construction of our manufacturing plant in Oakland. And that was going to massively uh, scale up our supply and help us grow to many more customers. So in 2018, that pendulum swung to the side of demand, where suddenly we were no longer supply constrained and we were demand constrained. 
We had the manufacturing plant built out in Oakland, and we started launching with these better burger chains, these fancier burger chains like White Castle. Not White Castle, not fancy, but like Gott's, Red Robin. White Castle's great, don't get me wrong, but not not I wouldn't call it fancy. Uh, Wall burgers and fat burgers. I think you, these are like the ten dollar burgers at the time uh, that you'd see versus a Burger King or a McDonald's. Uh, we were we were having some moderate success with better burger chains, but again, sales started to slow, and we we like, we, we wouldn't be we weren't able to fully max out capacity. And I spent a lot of time in manufacturing. When you're underutilizing a manufacturing plant, it hurts. You put a bunch of capex, which is capital, to build out that plant, and you're not able to spread out the cost of that capital because you're underutilizing it. Uh, you have you have labor that you're paying for that you're not actually using most efficiently. And so it's costing our business a tremendous amount of capital. Uh, so as a team, we all rushed over. We we're focusing on scaling up sales. How do we get the problem fixed? Uh, how do we really solve this problem? And uh, we did. We did, but thanks uh, not to our classic sales efforts, but because of a genius work by our marketing and comms department when we launched a new 2.0 recipe, possible 2.0. And that's when we, uh, technically, we, they said like we won CES. We like had the best product in CES, which is an absurd proposition given we're not a consumer electronic company. Uh, but they gave us the best product launched at CES. Uh, and at that time, because of all the buzz around our new recipe, we also won the Burger King account, where we were launching with them for the Impossible Whopper. Uh, but because of that, our sales grew immensely at that time. We went about 10 x our sales over that period of time. And so we shifted back to the manufacturing team and said, OK, you have underutilized capacity. I'm sure you can, you can handle this amount of uh, product. Uh, and they couldn't. We, 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 we realized our manufacturing system was absolutely broken. It wasn't running efficiently. And uh, we had a widely publicized supply constraint. We had like multiple articles on almost any jur every journal talking about how you can't get Impossible Burgers anywhere. We were on allocation. Our customers are really bothered and frustrated with us. Burger King was frustrated because they were, we, were la we were delaying their launch. It became a massive challenge. We were worried about the fate of the business. If we couldn't sell the product that we had promised to all these customers, would they, would they just stop buying from us? And so it was an all hands on deck. I basically, for a period of time, was just like living in Oakland. Uh, it, was, uh, it was like all hands on deck. It was incredibly uh, interesting to like learn more about the manufacturing environment. But we realized there are a lot of room to grow at getting manufacturing discipline and growing our capacity. Uh, after about a year, after a lot of hard work, bringing a lot of uh, experienced team members in, and, and uh, really making a more disciplined uh, manufacturing capacity uh, capability, and then also leveraging partnership with external contract manufacturers, we were able to grow our supply chain, grow our manufacturing footprint, and then ultimately successfully launch with Burger King and Starbucks and some retail grocery chains as well. Uh, so you can still get our product at Impossible Whopper and, and the Impossible Breakfast Sandwich at Starbucks. Uh, and that's thanks to a lot of the investment we put into building out our manufacturing footprint at that time. Uh, we had a couple other constraints later on. But in general, I think the business is less supply constrained uh, because of the work we put in to build that manufacturing capability. So I think one of the macro takeaways I'd say at this time is that when you are thinking about building a business in the consumer, consumer manufacturing space, uh, you have to keep in mind that, uh, that you have to be ready for the swing of that pendulum if you're in the manufacturing business. You should, if you are supply constrained, as you called out successfully, you've got to build that pipeline of sales. Keep track of it. Make sure that when you're done with that supply constraint, you can lever that sales up. And then when you uh, are demand constrained, make sure that the, the manufacturing environment is run in a disciplined way so that when you have to go back to scale up manufacturing, you're not caught by surprise. I think the, all, the other thing I'd say as a macro takeaway is you want to recognize your strengths and weaknesses. We had a really strong R&D department that developed the product itself and really strong brand that people really perceived as a high quality brand and partnerships with Burger King and Starbucks. But we had underinvested in the manufacturing know-how. Uh, and if you don't have that in-house, at the minimum, try to find the right partners. Like we brought on OSI, who was a helpful co-manufacturer that helped us build out our capabilities in manufacturing. To get a question? Yeah, so based on what you said about the pendulum, the market's cyclical. Is it like between supply and demand, or? It's not always cyclical. I think the, the challenge is when you are scaling up a software business, 
you can often just increase number of AWS servers. It's like a very different business where you can very quickly ramp up supply. When you have a manufacturing business, the lead time for expanding capacity, depending on the business, can be anywhere from three months to two years, right? And so that represents a major challenge. And if you overinvest in manufacturing capacity, you are you're losing money every day you're underutilizing that business. And so the big challenge for many businesses in the space is how do you pull the dial in the right way so that you're not underutilizing your asset and that you're not supply constrained. And so that's, I think that leads to the cyclical nature if you get it wrong. And so I think what you should, the goal is obviously not to have a pendulum that swings at all, to be right on target. I think the, in reality, it's really hard to do. But uh, that's, I think, the, one of the big takeaways here is that be prepared be building both sides of that business and investing in it because you don't want to get it wrong. We were, I remember when we were, uh, at, uh, at, we were in supply-constrained environment in 2019, we were like, losing uh, like a million dollars of opportunity every week because of unproduced product, and that hurt. That hurt when you're a fast-growing startup because that means every time we weren't selling a single pound, that was four burgers that could have gone to a first chance of customers trying our product that could have won those customers for life. And so that was like, it, it really hurt us as a business. It hurt our customers who are restaurants, mom and pop restaurants who are trying to sell burgers. Uh, and uh, it's a painful learning to have when you're growing as a business. Yeah. Um, what sorts of factors go into making that decision of how much to invest in manufacturing? Or is there like a set list or is it more subjective? Yeah. So what you're describing is called like an S&OP process, sales and operating planning process. And it is very difficult. And it is very difficult for a lot of businesses specifically in hard tech. Uh, and there's no like perfect answer. I think there's people who are trying to bring in the latest data to inform what the forecast could look like. You often do Monte Carlo analysis, where you create a bunch of different forecasts, and you plan for the 70th percentile scenario or the 30th percentile scenario. But ultimately, it's a judgment call. You, like, the CEO, at the end of the day, the, the, the head of supply chain manufacturing, has to make a call for how they want to invest in the business. And it has to be like a shared responsibility for the team to execute. But uh, if you undercall it, you're losing out on potential sales. If you overcall it, you're losing money uh, because you're underutilizing the plant. It's a, it's a tough thing. It's a thing that even big tech companies who are building data centers for AI workloads also struggle with. They're like, I'm not sure how this new chip is going to perform and how many data centers I'll need to be able to support my AI work for my, my business, it's the exact same type of thinking. Is like, what are the different scenarios I want to plan to? How do I want to think about uncertainty? Should I sign a contract with NVIDIA for this length of time because I want to have a, a de-risk it? For, I want to hedge my bet here. Uh, and so that's a, that a lot of these hard tech businesses have to think about it in an SNOP process. Yeah. One of the most common mistakes that hard tech companies make that SNOP process? I, so I think uh, one of the things is like you have to be nimble. <laughs> I think often you build the SNOP process too late. I think it's something that when you start realizing you're, you're building a forecast, the, that forecast has a real impact on how you plan the business. And I think in early days, people are like, oh, just build a forecast for the investors, call it, and we'll plan to that, we call it a day. It should be more sophisticated than that. Like the forecast that you're communicating, either to investors or internally, ends up resulting in a supply plan where people are actually buying product. They're signing agreement, agreement with a soy uh, producer to buy X amount of ingredients. You don't want it to be sitting in your warehouse and then code or expire. That's like really bad for your business. And so I think in the early days when you're scaling up a startup, it could be easy to take the, like the forecasting process lightly. What I'd say is try to build a more disciplined SNB process earlier uh, when you're like in a high growth manufacturing startup. Yes, yeah. Question about your original goal of actually reducing admissions, and yeah. then when you have these like decisions to actually have more plants, more manufacturing plants, how do you actually value your like reducing admissions with added manufacturing that could increase those admissions? Like, what are those processes that you like actually have to balance? Yeah, great question. So, uh, one could say with every manufacturing plant we build, it takes some emissions to set up the manufacturing plant. And our products produce emissions. I think for Impossible Foods, we were very much of the mind that every burger that we sell, or actually, let's say like 0.9 burgers of every burger that we sell is displacing a regular meat burger. Because at that time, the data suggested the alternative that people would be eating was actually not a veggie burger, it was like a regular burger. Because we were getting a lot of people who are flexitarian trying to buy our product. The alternative is so much worse for the planet. 
So our, our accounting, I think I showed you some graph around this like ratio of calorie conversion. Like the Impossible Burger is about a 50% calorie conversion ratio in that we are inefficient in that we take some parts of the soy plant, some parts of like, uh, uh, like yeast, et cetera, that we'll need to put in the product or coconut oil or whatever, and there's some waste associated with that. But it is massively more efficient at like 50% than ground beef, which is at like 3% efficiency. So I think it's, for us, it was always compared against the alternative versus thinking about the emissions that the product alone is having. Now, let's say uh, our product was not supplanting a destructive product, and it was just another product that people could buy, a purse or something like that, that would just add to someone's uh, uh, closet. Maybe we'd think about it differently. Um, but I think as a whole, uh, for many folks in the climate industry, you're thinking about displacement. You're displacing a destructive product, and that's the advantage. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions on Impossible before I jump into cement? Yes? Real quick. So Impossible is like synthetic kind of meat. So what are the nutritional challenges compared to natural food? Mm -hmm. And also compared to, just say, eggs or or milk, which are, seem more efficient than, than beef? Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist. But what I'll say is uh, the Impossible Burger isn't the healthiest product. It is not a salad. Uh, it is uh, closer to a ground beef product in nutrition than it is a salad. Much, much closer. It's very close in nutritionals to like, the regular 80-20 ground beef. The reason why it has to be that way is because what makes ground beef delicious is those nutritionals. Like, it is 80% protein, 20% fat. That fat, which is like, a, like fat that melts when you put it on the grill, creates the Maillard reaction, has a little bit of char, that's, that, that chew, that bite, that, that, that fat is what makes it delicious. And if you're trying to convince someone who'd be eating a burger to go to salad, We've already failed, right? Like, they're not doing that already. They've had that option for 30, 40 years, you know, at every restaurant available. Uh, but our goal is to convince them to go to a plant-based diet. And so I'd say, historically, the Impossible Burger has not been nutritionally that much better. No cholesterol, no trans fats, that's better. But it really has been close to the animal analog. Eventually, they're trying to improve the nutritionals without sacrificing taste, quality, texture, things like that. But ultimately, if you lose a customer, you're, it doesn't matter, right? And so I think Impossible Foods focused on creating a best-in-class tasting product first and foremost, and then always saying, hey, we're never going to be worse nutritionally. Our goal is to get better nutritionally. That was a strategy at that time. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's a big push towards like whole foods diet, and these products are not that. And I think they'll never be that because you cannot make something that tastes like ground beef from Whole Foods. Uh, that's, just, that's just part of the part of the world we live in. How are you doing on time? OK. Oh, good to go? Yeah, you've already done a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, uh, maybe I'll blast through it. Um, yeah, we have, uh, so, so we, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Brimstone. So I worked, I joined as the head of BD and finance at a company called Brimstone. And Brimstone's main goal is to decarbonize the concrete and cement sector. sector. So if you look at uh, the cement industry, it's around 2.8 gigatons of CO2 in the Sankey diagram, which roughly is equivalent to 5.5% of net greenhouse gas emissions. And of the concrete industry as a whole, 90% of emissions come from cement, which is the glue, the binder, that holds the concrete together. Now, the reason why that problem exists is because the traditional process uses limestone, calcium carbonate, clay and sand, sources of silica, puts it all in a kiln, grinds it up, puts it in the kiln, raises it to very high temperatures to release CO2, form calcium oxide as an intermediary, and then ultimately form the clinkering compounds, tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate, and tetracalcium aluminoferrate. So those four clinkering compounds are key to making something known as ordinary Portland cement, that is what everybody uses as cement today, and it is like an important like benchmark for for building materials across the United States. The brimstone process aims to use calcium silicate rocks with calcium, silica, aluminum, and iron 
a, a new process that they're developing to form the same clinker in compounds and something known as supplementary cementitious materials, another core ingredient in concrete as a whole. Now, this is a new process, and it's very challenging to scale a new process, and brimstone is in the early days. What I'd say is these hard to bait sectors like fertilizer, steel, cement, chemicals, they're very challenging, but they can be very rewarding because they, they represent a huge part of the overall climate problem. Now, there's some challenges I want to call out about scaling like hard to bait tech like this that I would say is even harder in many ways than plant-based meats. One of them is that the scale-up requires a tremendous amount of capital. When you start, you start at the lab scale, which is like you're spending some time with research scientists building a process. Eventually, after you refine that, prove it out, then you go to a pilot scale, where everything acts a little bit differently. And that takes about 18 months to build a pilot plant. Once you're there, you have to operate it for a period of time, learn from the pilot plant, and then ultimately build a first-of-a-kind commercial plant. That takes typically two years with permitting and approvals and building out the plant, acquiring the, the equipment. It takes a long time to build that first-of-a-kind commercial plant that's also subscale. You're still not at full scale yet. After that is operating, you're, you're, you're showing that you can produce it at a slightly larger commercial scale. That's when then you've just de-risked it sufficiently to build a full industrial scale plant. The pilot plant can cost anywhere from $5 million to $50 million. It's pretty expensive. A first-of-a-kind commercial plant can range between $100 million to $400 million in total costs. That's a ton of capital. And then a full-scale industrial plant can be upwards of a $1 billion plus, especially in the chemicals, cement, and steel sector. That's an enormous amount of capital that's very hard to raise by VC alone. The other thing you can get is debt. You can raise debt to fund these projects. But one of the challenges, and that's what's been historically done in the solar industry, in the wind industry. But the challenge is it often requires a pre-purchase agree agreement with a customer, or also known as an off-take agreement. These are things like a power purchase agreement for wind energy or solar energy. That's traditional in like the energy space, but not traditional in cement and steel. If I'm a concrete manufacturer, I just call my buddy at the, at the cement manufacturing plant, tell him how much I want, he sends over an invoice, and we're good to go. It is not a contract you do years in advance. That's what makes it challenging to get debt in these industries. The other thing is, anything before you're at the full-scale industrial plant production will likely require a premium, even if your design of your process ends up making a cost parity process, because you're operating at a subscale. So you're going to need to find customers that are willing to play, pay a premium for your products, which is hard to do in sectors like cement, steel, and fertilizer, where the farmers or the concrete manufacturers don't really want to pay a premium. I think the final thing is these products are actually quite cheap per ton, and that means it's very expensive to transport. You often need to co-locate supply with demand. And if you're in the small scale at a first uh, of a kind commercial plant, it's really challenging if the people that want to buy your product are spread all over the world or even all over the United States. You can't transport it everywhere. So these are some of the main challenges to building companies in, in this hard tech sector. But there's some ways that can help to get you around it. One of them is being pursued by a number of different companies, and these are called book and claim credits or inset credits. And they're like renewable energy certificates or sustainable aviation fuel credits, it's where you separate out the virtual low-carbon attributes of the product from the physical product. So like, let me, let me explain. So let's say I make one ton of cement. I, my person, who my, my customer, uh, who, let's say Stanford is my customer who wants to buy the cement, and I'm making the cement in the Midwest. I can't transport from the Midwest to, to Stanford. The typical transportation radius is about 300 miles for, for cement. Uh, instead, what I'll do is I'll find a local concrete buyer to buy the cement and say, buy it at normal price, and I'll tell you it's normal cement. It's just regular old cement. It's at a high carbon amount. And then Stanford, I'll sell the virtual credit associated with the low carbon nature of the asset, and that represents the premium of the product in the early days. And so a lot of people are trying to separate out the virtual asset of the premium product associated with low-carbon nature from the physical product in order to get around this issue of co-location. 
Uh, one of the big challenges here is making sure you don't double count. Because if you double count, count, you lose all credibility. And so they're trying to build the right systems in place to ensure an insetting carbon system for steel, cement, for, for fertilizer, and things like that. The other way that you can help uh, uh, scale hard tech is applying for federal grants. Brimstone recently won uh, GOE, Office of Clean Energy, uh, a, a demonstrations project grant for $189 million. Those types of grants are huge in enabling you to, to build out plants like this. So that's, that's a little bit about Brimstone. Uh, very briefly, I'll talk about, I have 10 minutes left, is that right? Uh, actually, I should probably stop for questions. Uh, Five minutes. All right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll take a couple minutes here. I think uh, Gravity is the company I'm at now where I'm leading the scale up uh, with our customers. Uh, we enable everybody from private equity firms to enterprise customers to industrial manufacturers to very easily measure their carbon emissions across all of the different sites, across all of the different portfolio companies. As you know, probably many requirements exist now by the SEC and by, uh, by, by governmental entities in Europe to, to really show that you're measuring your carbon emissions. Gravity allows you to very quickly do that. The other thing that we do is we work with our customers to evaluate ROI positive projects that help enable decarbonization. And there's a really cool graph that I want to talk through called a MAC curve. Some of you may have been familiar with it before. This is a marginal abatement cost curve. It's a little bit confusing to look at, but what it is is on the top line you see five gigatons of CO2 as the, the opportunity to get you back to, to uh, the levels we want to hit our global targets. That's how much CO2 we have to remove on a yearly basis from being produced. There, if you look but, but earlier ahead of the zero dollars on the base on the on the x side of the axis, you can see that you can get about one and a half gigatons of CO2 avoided below the zero dollars in the axis. What that means is there are things that actually pay back, that pay you money, that actually reduce about a, a gigaton and a half of CO2 emissions. Now, if you want to put fifty dollars per ton of CO2 uh, into carbon dioxide credits you actually can uh, remove much more CO2 by deploying technologies like electric vehicles, solar vo photovoltaics, onshore wind, things like that. So this MAC curve shows the, the size of the prize of new technologies across the cost curve. What's really great is that actually over time, more and more things will make ROI positive sense as they come down the cost curve. And our goal at Gravity is to help work with our customers to find the right technologies that make ROI positive sense to deploy right now. And those, some of those technologies like HVAC retrofits, vehicle electrification, they already exist, and we're helping our customers do that. All right, final takeaways. Uh, I know we probably have to stop now, but the last minute is uh, large corporations are leading a lot of the climate actions today. We still need to bring the long tail of smaller enterprises and industrial manufacturers. We need to find ways to engage them and find ROI positive ways to help them decarbonize. The other thing is for consumers, climate is still not a top factor in purchasing decisions. We didn't get into this that much, but there is more we need to do to educate customers on the challenges around, around climate change and how it connects to their behavior in the real world. Like the food that we put on our plate actually has a direct impact on the planet. And the last thing is the one motivator for all customers in the consumer space is improved performance and lower costs. If you can align your, your climate company or your climate work with any of those things, a better performance or lower cost, you're much more likely to be successful. So I think I should probably stop there. I think, sorry I went a little bit over, uh, but thanks for all your questions there. But now I'll open it up for some questions. Tour de force. Thank you very much. Uh, any <laughs> remaining questions? I know we have a lot of good questions. So yeah. uh, how do you set the limitation, like the structures, policies within a company to manage employees? Set how how do you like, set the policies to manage the structures employees? Structures or policies within a company to manage employees, or preventing your those trained employees from. Being stolen by competitors. <laughs> oh, for IP. So for it's, IP. It's the labor input, not the capital. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, it's, oh, to be like, for the labor to to go to a competitor. Is that what you're asking? Okay, so you know when you start a company, right? Yeah. The most important thing is to manage people, right? Mm -hmm. But 
so there are people, there should be a structure of yeah. managing them. How do you avoid, uh, how do you activate the bright side of human nature to motivate them and avoiding the dark side of human nature? Yeah. And how do you set that kind of structure to activate the, the bright side? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer it. I'll try to, <laughs> try to answer it as best I can. I think uh, one benefit working in climate is that everybody I've worked with typically has had a shared mission. And I think that's one of the blessings of the work that I've had to date is that everybody has been excited about the work you're doing because you think it's going to have a positive impact on the, pla on the planet. I think the other way I think you can help motivate people is be an empathetic and kind manager. Uh, recognize what motivates them, try to support them in their goals and their dreams, make sure that the work they're doing feels constructive and productive, and pay them a fair wage. I think if you do those things, generally, people will be happy. If you start acting out and not treating people with respect, if you, if you uh, don't pay them a fair wage at what they deserve, uh, you'll lose employees. But that's, I think, that's the best I can do, at least, to answer that question. But what to do your company trying to steal in your employees? Yeah, I mean, um, just be better. I think ultimately, like, the, the, the best outcome is to, like, out-execute your competitor and be a better culture than your competitor. I think uh, there's always going to be someone who tries to pay your highest value employee a crazy amount of money to steal them, right? But are, you, are they going to be able to give your employee, like, the best working environment, give them the long-term likelihood of success? If, they, if your employee thinks our company is going to go succeed at a much, a much higher valuation at the end of the day, they're going to be motivated to stay around, even if they can get paid an annual salary that's better somewhere else. And so I think, the, I think my answer is just out-execute, be a better company, be a better leader, and hopefully they'll choose to stay. But if they don't, I think that's also reasonable. Yeah? How has the public sector, maybe like government intervention in this space, made your life more difficult, or have they been like helpful? Like, What's one thing you wish they would do to make your life better? Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, I'm pretty optimistic about a lot of these grants. I think what we've found based on scaling hard tech companies like this is you need a tremendous amount of capital. And uh, VCs, are it's hard to get that much capital from VCs alone. And they expect returns at a faster t turnaround and timeline than, than often is possible with like hard tech companies like this. Uh, Grants are enable, oh, an enabler for this, and they're a good way to, to do that, to, like, to help scale. Uh, I would also say is but you also don't want to bet on policy. Administrations can change very quickly, and policies can change quickly. So your goal is to plan without any policy support and maybe plan for uh, headwinds in terms of policy. And then if you end up getting tailwinds, that's just a benefit. Um, and, and hopefully you're set up to take advantage of those tailwinds. Mentioned that like you don't want to bet on policy, but it seems a lot of the ways to make some of this stuff viable is through betting on policy and making sure the government is providing incentives. Yeah. Are, are there areas you think, I don't know, like for example, like, gra like gra what gravity is doing, it's dependent on number one companies wanting to support ESG. You guys are doing positive ROI things, which is good. A lot of companies just care about the carbon stuff. Yeah. Like are, are there specific sectors which you think are immune to needing any type of political tailwind? Oh, huh, good question. Um, there, there are definitely, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it, it varies by a lot of industries. The lar large corporations seem motivated to do this on their own. And uh, I'm grateful that's happening. Uh, I wouldn't say that's the case for all, all sectors. I think my mission now is to try to activate the long tail of people who wouldn't be taking these actions otherwise. And I think that is like the, the place that is like under-resourced and under-focused on. And I think that's why we focus on ROI positive things. I think we'll benefit from like more ESG requirements from a government entity, but the goal is our work should be providing bottom line business value, and that is universal. And I think that's kind of what we focus on. Um, I appreciate your impacts across different sectors. Uh, my question is, how do you find or design your role that fits both your backgrounds, your passion, and also like what the company needs? Ah, great question. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good answer. I think I've gotten lucky at my roles to date. Uh, in early part of my career, I wasn't unsure. When I joined Impossible Foods, I started out working a lot on sales strategy, uh, but then very quickly shifted over to manufacturing scale-up. 
And I was just drawn to the biggest problem for the company at the time. And I think that has actually proven well for me, that like I'm interested in having an impact, personal impact, and that means just focus on what the biggest problems are. Over time, I've now shifted more on the commercial side because I'm just like not technical enough to be as strong as like a manufacturing leader, but I feel like I'm much stronger on the commercial side, and that's where I've ended up going. Uh, I, I, I've been fortunate. Uh, I don't have a great answer, unfortunately. Yeah, in the back there. Why do you think large corporations care more and consumers are behind the curve in terms of Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great question. I think not all large corporations care more, maybe. Uh, there are certain, certain corporations that tend to have high margins that are caring more, and they can afford to care more. Uh, so uh, companies in the tech space are buying up direct air capture carbon credits. They're buying up nature-based offsets, uh, all of these things. Uh, if you're a low-margin business but, but buying these things, you'll be quickly stopped by your shareholders and your board of directors. So I think the people that are motivated to do this right now are people who are just have tremendously high margin, and uh, it's probably probably a differentiator for their investors and for their, their customers, and that's why they do it, or they're motivated by some internal sense of good. Uh, for consumers, it's just not top of mind. I think that's the big problem. It's just it's not top of mind for them. I also think this is not a consumer problem. I think most of this problem is caused by industry and like heavy industry and, and corporations that are consuming the resources of our planet. So I don't want to put all of this on to the consumer. I think we need to focus on taking our hard to bait sectors and decarbonizing it. And I hope, I hope you understand that how, how big the opportunity is for that. Does that, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had kind of two questions. Uh, with Brimstone, how hard was it to convince purchasers that the cement is the same and that it's going to hold up in the same ways? And is that all pretty much standardized in terms of how this stuff is tested, or is that like a tough you know, thing to surmount? Yeah, no, actually, luckily, there's an ASTM C150 standard for ordinary Portland cement, and it sets a, like a bunch of experiments around compression testing, the chemical like makeup of the cement. And if you meet that threshold, it is ordinary potent cement. ASTM C150, ordinary potent cement. And I think once we proved that at Brimstone, uh, it was a good uh, check mark. Uh, that said, uh, there are other, uh, I think we're, Sublime speakers coming later in this quarter. Uh, they have another cement product that is not ordinary potent cement. But if they can have, prove that they meet the attributes that they need to show to customers that they, they are good for certain use cases, they could also be very successful. I think Brimstone's strategy was really focused on ordinary potent cement. That isn't to say that that's the only strategy to succeed in this space. And just kind of related to that, Brimstone's process, does that still require a lot of heat? Uh, it does require heat and electricity, um, but uh, because it doesn't produce any uh, process carbon, and actually because magnesium is in the rock, there's some carbon that could be captured as a part of the process, it ends up being much more efficient. Let's do two more quick ones, one back here and one back in the note. Um, is it possible? Um, like, I feel like it's hard to uh, kind of get the population onto that. I feel like we're more of a um, Out of curiosity, do you guys have the percent of people within the company that actually buy impossible? Ooh. Uh, I, so the question was, do we have a percent of people at Impossible who buy Impossible? Uh, I will say when I was at Impossible, uh, I ate Impossible every week, maybe a couple times a week, uh, and, but I never bought it because I just get it for free. So it's a hard question to ask because we would just go to the, the kitchen <laughs> in the, the company. Uh, I, uh, I still buy Impossible every week today, uh, even though I left uh, a few years ago. Uh, so uh, I, I don't, have a, yeah, don't have the number, but I'd guess pretty high up there. The Impossible Chicken Nuggets, if you haven't tried it, are pretty dang good. Pretty dang good, yeah. Last question. Uh, this is more about your, your general career path, but it seems like the traditional knock against consultants from people in the startup industry is that they don't know what it's like to work on something of their own. So would you say there are certain lessons that you learned working at uh, Brimstone, Impossible, and Gravity that you could not have learned as a consultant? Absolutely. I'd say like, that one of the, my biggest uh, challenges with being at Bain was not seeing the project all the way through and going from the recommendation uh, to all the way to implementation. Because actually when you get to implementation and then see the after effects, there's follow-on work. 
to fix the problems associated with your recommendation to like get to the end result that you want. And that was only learned when I was at a possible when I was at Brimstone. And so there, that, that definitely is something you don't really get often in, in a consulting environment. Uh, and I think I, I wasn't as fulfilled in consulting because of that. But I think a lot of folks who are really, interesting, uh, really interested in solving problems and just love problem solving, love consulting. Because it's all problem solving, and then you move on after the recommendation's over. Uh, so it all depends on how you think. If you really like to get your hands dirty and see the result, maybe consulting is not right for you. Great. With that said, uh, Akshay, thanks for a, a words of wisdom and a great talk. And thanks to the audience for an equally great set of questions. I think you would agree with that. Yes, definitely. Thanks Thank you so much. much.